Black Lagoon, as we've covered a few times before, is an anime steeped in real world history. Much more than just a staging device or a quick way to give background to its characters, these real world events shape the motivations of these deeply developed characters. We've already covered the recurring ones like Balalaika or Roberta, but even one-off characters can share the same quality. And that's what we'll be focusing on in today's video as we look deeper at Masahiro Takanaka, the Japanese co-leader of the Protectors of the Islamic Front. Much more than just a foil for rock, his entire personality is shaped by real-world events and possibly even by a man who committed a gut-wrenching attack in the early 1970s. With that in mind, I want to give a warning before the video proceeds, we will be covering genuine acts of terror in this video. To try and be as respectful as possible for those lives lost, this video won't be monetized at all and will deviate from the usual branding. Additionally, I'm no expert on historical matters, I'm just another person on the internet doing some research. For this profile, we only need to approach things very generally, so this is less of a history lesson and more of a brief outline. So I encourage you not to just take my summary here as the full picture, but to check out the resources I used to gather this information in the pinned comment below. Now we can get started on our story for today. The post-war era was a tumultuous one for Japan, one which saw it locked in what some have described as the war for the soul of a nation. The first few years of US occupation led to the encouragement and even implementation of progressive policies now that a war-dominated government could no longer shut out forces from the left. However, the rise of the Cold War led to a shift in US policy, which then in turn led to more focus on Japan as a strategic point, one which needed to be defended from communism, rather than on building an independent and democratic nation. This led to a regression on those progressive policies that had had only a few years to prosper. Now that is an exceptionally bare bones explanation of what we needed to cover our next topic. The early 1960s saw Japan's largest protests of all time centered around ANPO, a shortened term for the security treaty in place with the US. Due to this treaty and its sister one, Japan received autonomy once more, however they had to cede to US military demands. These included giving them an excessive number of bases, limiting who Japan could partner with, allowing the United States to intervene in Japanese affairs while simultaneously not requiring them to protect Japan, and capping it all off with no timetable for any eventual withdrawal. Signed in 1952, the automatic renewal in 1960s would spark wide-scale protests, drawing in a wide range of citizens from workers to farmers to mothers and students. However, Prime Minister at the time, Nobusuke Kishi, a man who was imprisoned for suspected war crimes at the end of World War II, refused to respond to any pressure, and renewal passed, although he later resigned in disgrace. The failure of these demonstrations to make an impact began a deep splintering of the Japanese left, who were beginning to be closed out once more after a brief attempt at the stage. Being shut out for so long, they lacked common and binding ideals. The wide range of demonstrators brought with them a similarly wide range of issues. Some saw the movement as pro-democratic, others as anti-imperialist, and everything in between. One such splintering was of the Zenga Kuren. Formed in the late 40s, it was the All Japan Federation of Student Self-Government Associations. Defeated by the lack of success during the Anpo movements, over the 1960s the once overarching association was plagued by infighting, splitting into multiple sects across the country and its universities. Those sects themselves could then see even more infighting. We could get a lot more specific about the underlying factors, emerging groups, and so on here as the issues surrounding the student protests grow even more complex, but I feel that's better left to the experts. For now, we're focusing on these student groups themselves, because that's where the once dormant overall movement began to fight once more. In June of 1968, tensions began to flare up when the University of Tokyo, the most prestigious college in Japan, implemented controversial new internship policies for its medical students. Seen as essentially free labor for years, the students demanded reform, which eventually led to large-scale demonstrations and even the barricading of the university by protesters. At its height, this spread to 111 universities. They formed under the banner of the Zen Kyoto, which served as a leading organization for the protest, attempting to string together the different locations, demands, and students. However, this was only a band-aid, as by 1970 most of the universities had returned to normal operation after 1969 cancellations of entrance exams. There's many reasons for the downfall of these movements. Initially, coverage of them was sympathetic, but over time sentiment turned against them, seeking to return to normal. The government also implemented new policies which were very much anti-left and anti-demonstration, 
while the Japanese Communist Party shifted more center-left amidst growing Cold War pressures. With new powers, protest crackdowns began with force. The most famous of these was probably the already mentioned University of Tokyo. There's many others we could look at, but that one's the most relevant for today because it's actually specifically shown in Black Lagoon right here when Takanaka is speaking to Rock. So we can assume he was present for those events. And as the crackdowns began, involvement with the protests became a danger to future success, the very reason these students had put up with years of stressful schooling. As public opinion turned against them, less and less employers would hire a former revolutionary. The only ones who remained were those committed to essentially becoming full-on outcasts. I think this is the purpose of another specific image from Black Lagoon, the Tower of the Sun seen here. Built for Expo 70, a 1970 World's Fair held in Suida, Japan, an event whose motto was progress and harmony for mankind. I probably don't need to explain how this would run contrary to the revolution which was just put down hardly even a year before. While some were still lost in turmoil, their country and the world celebrated. And as a final note on how the movement died, infighting was rampant as always, as still no common ideal had been established to rally behind. Some of these later splits became very impactful to the course of history. With another failed movement in its dying breaths, the splinters began to grow based around something else. The use of force. Seeing how little success there was from more traditional and even sometimes already aggressive methods, some began to advocate for the use of violence or even downright terrorism to achieve their goals. One such split was within the Communist League, which divided majorly between East and West on the subject of extremism. From this split then arose what would become the Red Army Faction, which argued violence had become a necessity due to the failure of current methods and a growingly powerful police response. One more step away from this, traceable to the Red Army faction is the Japanese Red Army of the 1970s. The organization was a mix of Trotsky's ideas such as simultaneous worldwide revolution and violence as a necessity to overthrow the bourgeoisie, as well as their own frustrations with the already mentioned lack of effectiveness they'd seen. They held a belief that violent acts would draw support as well as forcing draconian measures, then decreasing overall support for the ruling class. We can even point to the JRA specifically for our story today because it's seen in this image here, the Yodago hijacking incident or Japan Airlines Flight 351. This was the first major action of the JRA on March 31st, 1970. The flight from Tokyo Honda Airport was bound for Fukuoka with 122 passengers on board. Three JRA members stood up 20 minutes past takeoff, armed with swords, explosives, and guns, which may have all been fakes. Nonetheless, they hijacked the flight and aimed for North Korea to show solidarity with the nation and protest its treatment on the world stage. Fooled into landing in South Korea instead, they eventually saw through the ruse and forced another takeoff, but only after exchanging all the passengers for Japan's transport minister at the time, Yamamura Shinjiro, who volunteered to be a symbolic hostage, on the agreement they would allow him and the crew to return to Japan once they had landed in North Korea. They agreed, and upon landing, the flight was released back to Japan. As the name suggests, the Japanese Red Army were very militant, described as an authoritarian organization. However, the lack of access to weapons and training in Japan led to an interesting exchange. Members who wished to become active revolutionaries had to leave for the Middle East, usually specifically Beirut, to train with the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, or the PFLP. There they would receive training and even possibly orders for the furtherance of their goals. Here we reach the story of Kozo Okamoto. Listed as the inspiration for Takinaka on the Black Lagoon Wikipedia page, I was unfortunately unable to confirm this myself. While not a full-on one-to-one, their stories certainly line up just enough, he very well could have been an inspiration. Whether he is or isn't, however, doesn't change the fact that Okamoto serves as one of the most well-documented examples of a JRA member. Coming from a middle-class family with what his father described as an uneventful upbringing, Okamoto had tried to enter Kyoto University, one of the centers of the late 60s student movements, and where his brothers, one of whom would become a Yodigo hijacker, had attended. Failing the entrance exams twice, he settled on the smaller and more local Kagoshima University. While studying, he radicalized himself around the idea of pollution, believing that the efforts of individual scientists would not have an appreciable effect, so more drastic action would need to be taken. He also engaged with the Bahrain, a peace organization, but he was unimpressed with its demonstrations seeing them as simply masturbation to make the participants happy. 
At a smaller university, he was unable to engage directly with the RAF much, but his brother's connections did eventually see him sent to the Middle East for training. On the outskirts of the organization, he was unconcerned and somewhat unfamiliar with the RAF's finer ideology, only caring that it encompassed his political frustrations. What Okamoto was truly concerned with was simply becoming a revolutionary. His idea was described as not one of ends justifying means, but a more fundamental vagueness about what are ends and what are means. The enemies he sought to destroy were often vague, sometimes seeking to help those being crushed by the bourgeoisie, other times seeing them as the enemy as well for enabling such a ruling class. From all of this, we can gather a definitive answer that his highest goal was nothing more than the act of revolution for its own sake. As we mentioned, he was sent to Beirut for training after police presence in Japan increased, responding to JRA activities. There, he received nine weeks of training and was enlisted for a joint JRA and PFLP mission, what would become a shocking and deadly terror attack, the Maud Airport Massacre. With false passports in hand, Okamoto and two others embarked on a roundabout trip through Europe, eventually landing in Rome. There, automatic rifles and hand grenades were dropped in their luggage. Picking back up, they boarded a flight bound for Tokyo with a stopover in Tel Aviv. Arriving at Lod Airport, the three ripped the photos from their false passports in preparation for death as they sought to make their faces unrecognizable after their attack. Returning to gather their baggage, they stopped before the customs counter, opened their cases, and began firing into the crowd. In under two minutes, they killed 26 people and wounded another 80. Among the wounded were tourists, airport personnel, a prominent Israeli scientist, and 17 Puerto Rican Christians. The other two attackers were killed, one by gunfire and the other by a grenade, while Okamoto ran out of the terminal. Quickly apprehended, he claims the plans had changed for him to attack a flight outside, however it's possible he was also meant to stay alive as a messenger. He used his ensuing trial to confirm his own guilt, seeking the death penalty and also making claims about the purpose of the attack. I won't do him the service of listing those, but will instead end his story on a chilling quote from his trial. When I was a child, I was told that when people died they became stars. I didn't really believe it, but I could appreciate it. We three Red Army soldiers wanted to become Orion when we died, and it calms my heart to think that all the people we killed will also become stars in the same heavens. As the revolution goes on, how the stars will multiply. After a series of events including a hijacking, prisoner exchange, and further arrest, as of 2016, Okamoto was residing in Beirut and still wanted for extradition to Japan. He's remarked about wanting to return there once more. Before we return to talking about anime, I want to include a reminder once more. In limited time, both in terms of YouTube and on my end in producing this video, I'm unable to do justice to just how complex all these situations have been. There are many more factors and details that have been left out that turn these from simple facts into the stories of nations, their people, and the victims of a heinous attack. I really do strongly encourage you to look more into the events on your own, to have a greater grasp on them, presented by people much more worthy of doing so than me. It's not lost to me that I'm talking about terror attacks in relation to anime, and I don't mean any disrespect to the lives lost by doing so. But I felt it was a necessary part of the history that shouldn't be left out, and it provides the most complete picture of a man who's most likely the inspiration for our following topic. With that said, we can move on to Black Lagoon, and Masahiro Takayaka. Now, he spans across only two episodes, so this will be one of the lighter profiles we've done, but that doesn't mean his character is any less interesting than others, just more succinct, and one who perfectly fits some of the themes we've discussed before. At first, the man seems almost like a sort of contradiction. He's involved in quite a serious battle, when described by his comrade Ibraha as something that will change the entire world, an idea quite in line with the Trotsky-esque goals which led to the JRA's birth. But despite this, and against the demeanor of his friend, Takanaka is unusually casual. He hardly responds to the bad news that their assault on the Hong Kong tribe and Chang has failed, simply remaining in bed and starting to predict his foe's next move. He digs in his ears and sings, lacking any obvious signs of care. Even when he's face to face with a righteous Revy, he hardly flinches. When Rock is, as far as they know, Holding out the information critical to their plan, he refuses to do anything more than talk calmly. And probably most tellingly, he angers Ibraha by saying, All this is nothing more than one big chess game, brother. Takanaka doesn't actually care about the mission that's being plotted here. 
The ends of their actions don't matter to him at all, what matters is simply that they are taking the actions, that they're playing the game. To further show his disconnect, despite working with the protectors of the Islamic Front, he openly admits to being an atheist, meaning he has no connection to any ideals that may hold either. He's just fighting because. This is something Rock quickly picks up on, saying, And what about you? You don't have a mission anymore, do you? And he's 100% right. We can look back to the history around him for why this is the case. We know from his story and the images accompanying it, he was active in the late 60s student revolution. There were many reasons why the movement and its resulting groups died out, as we said, but the most relevant to Takenaka is the content splintering and lack of an overall ideal to follow. This meant that someone engaging in these movements didn't necessarily have to be doing it for any certain reason. It didn't have to be for better schooling or conditions while there or to change the social order. It could just be because. While well, groups like the Zen Kyoto attempted to unify, what they really did was add more fuel to the fire. They welcomed all comers, regardless of affiliation or goal. This provided the perfect platform for people like Takenaka to live out their ambitions of becoming revolutionaries. He shares a similar ideal system to that of Okamoto. While speaking with Rock, he mentioned some of these topics. These days, Japan's full to the brim with petite bourgeois on activism and the concept of permanent worldwide revolution. While these are platforms, they're very non-committal, unspecific in their target. For example, some of these student movement protesters were against the internship programs. They had a specific end goal others needed to be pressured into fulfilling. What these conversely loose ideals allowed our real and fictional men alike to do was direct their aggression towards whatever was fitting and consider that a good enough reason to fight. First, it was against their own government because it was convenient. Then this shifted to the wider world and whatever places were vulnerable for attack. Takenaka can fight for an Islamic group despite being an atheist because he has no care for ideals, just aggression itself. Playing the game of war. Another of their exchanges makes this clear as day. Don't be blinded by our ideals! Be blinded? What the fuck are you talking about? Isn't that the whole reason we've been fighting? And the final words we hear from him put it best. As he walks away from someone living a normal life in Japan, the exact thing he discarded, he says this. My job is to be an enemy of the state. Once again, a half goal which is seeking no outcome, just wanting to engage in methods for their own sake. There's another reason why he takes everything so lightly though, and that's because he skewed his life to such a degree he has nothing left but revolution. Another part of his exchange with Rock centers around being outcasts from Japan. He compares them in an attempt to shift Rock to his side, but the former businessman correctly recognizes that they aren't in the same situation, responding with the fact that only one of them was chased out of the country. Rock chose to leave everything behind and work for nothing. He could have gone back what he wanted, and we see him struggle with this later. Takanaka, however, was forced to leave it all, and this is the important distinction. Takanaka takes revolution to be a game, something unserious for him, because he doesn't have anything else left, it was all left behind. Revolution is all he has, and winning means it ends. For him to exist, there needs to be that simultaneous worldwide revolution he once used as vague justification. This is what we mentioned earlier, with the fact that those who remained late into the student movements began to risk their future, that they had to be willing to become outcasts for their ideals. The most radical had no hope for employment, marriage, children, no hope for the life everyone else had left the movement behind for. He shows disdain for those who gave up revolution for comfort in his thinly veiled story, saying, as long as their lives were comfortable, it didn't matter to them what happened to the world. By taking on this mindset along with the status of being a late revolutionary, he isolated himself even more. He had no one left besides the echo chamber of the JRA, and even if he did, he wouldn't want them around. We can see this dislike for those with normal lives in his airport interactions. He avoids this man because of his own status as a wanted man, but also because this is a conversation he doesn't want to have. Look at how his tone changes so quickly after saying goodbye. To look at someone who has everything he left behind for revolution, that's the exact kind of person he decided to hate. We can call this isolation, both from country and from friend, the cost to his actions. Takenaka speaks fondly of Japan to rock, as if he forgot his own situation for a moment. It's the one time he looks actually happy, not just casual. He was living the great life then, a revolutionary who also had a normal life. But as society changed around him, this was lost to him forever. He had to choose one or the other. 
This is something else he has in common with Okamoto. Interviewed since his horrendous actions, the mass murderer has expressed a want to return to Japan at least one more time. But for the rest of his life, he's rightfully denied that wish, just as Takenaka is. While some did go to the Middle East for training in return, once they were involved in any kind of mission, the odds of them returning were slim to none. These weren't subtle crimes they were committing. Even if they lived, their names and faces were known. Takenaka lost faith in ideals as he sought to become a revolutionary for his own sake, and that in part led to his casual nature. But it's also because he saw just how much he had to give up for so little gain. Why should he try to achieve anything ever again? Why should he try to win if it might cost him even more than the pittance he has left? And so little gain is what makes that last point worth anything. He paid with what he had, but what did he gain for it outside of becoming a revolutionary? One of the key points of the 60s movement that led to groups like the JRA wasn't just the lack of common ideals, but also the lack of success. Becoming increasingly radicalized as they witnessed constant failure to make a change, they turned to extreme methods in the hope they could finally do what they failed to. At every step along the way, Takenaka learned more and more that these radical and violent actions didn't create any more success than what had came before them, even at such a greater cost. If he was active in the late 60s and now it's the mid 90s, that means he's seen something like 25 years with no change from his acts, despite paying for them all. From peaceful demonstrations to the barricading of universities to gut-wrenching terror attacks. And personally, his own banishment and lack of impact. He left behind the place he loved for what's amounted to nothing. He's not just given up his entire life, he's done so for nothing tangible. So naturally, after all of that failure, he doesn't see their actions here as something that will actually change the world. I think as far as he's concerned, that's nearly impossible anymore. So he's casual and hardly tries, even when he's gotten excellent at what he does. And this circles back into his fighting just to be a revolutionary. Not just because he wanted to be one once and it's all he knows, but because he has to be one now, because there's nothing else left. But there's one more key difference that makes his character more than the mass murderer he may be based on. He's a leader, where the real-life counterpart was a follower. This goes hand-in-hand hand with him trying to push his ideals onto Rock as well. After the Laud Airport Massacre, Okamoto spent his entire trial spouting off propaganda and trying to secure the death penalty for himself. He had completed his mission, and in a twisted mindset, he viewed death as a key part of his romanticized idea of a revolutionary. Takenaka as a leader isn't like this. He's an actual commander, protecting Chang and the Lagoon Company's moves at every turn, even if he's unable to stop them. His trained intuition leads him down the right path every time. He studies up on the best practices of war, making it a point not to underestimate his opponents. And the very thing that causes him to kill Ibraha is his refusal to withdraw his troops from a certain death charge straight into US-backed forces, a move which would have led to their certain destruction and the end of their goals all the same. Just as he can't win or else his purpose ends, he also can't lose. He needs them to stay alive to keep the revolution alive. He can't pay all that cost himself. Being a revolutionary doesn't come cheap, and he himself has nothing left to give. So he needs others to give it for him, and that's why he's a leader, and why he has to try and be a good one. But if he simply wanted to be gone and wasn't fighting for anything, why wouldn't he allow himself to die? To call it a day with his dream technically accomplished. Why would he become a leader and keep prolonging everything? His most striking quote to Rock might explain this. I gambled my entire life on this. If I stop now, all of it is just one big lie. He's not just fighting for his future. To be able to keep doing the one thing he knows and is able to do, he could die and that would be resolved. He's also fighting for his past. To validate everything that he's done up to this point. If he stops, he acknowledges that yes, as he's feared for so long, it's all been pointless. If he dies, his life was pointless. The fact he can admit this to Rock means he knows deep down that it's more than likely true. But as long as he keeps fighting, it's not certain. It's like what we discussed with the Lush and the Utilitarian Revolution. In a short summary, when you see the ends as justifying the means, what happens when you never reach that end? You're left only with death for the sake of death. So you have to keep going no matter what. This is the same thing rattling around Takenaka's mind. And him being a leader can pull double duty as one way to possibly reconcile this. It's odd that he tries so hard to say he and Rock are the same. It does feel out of place and very forced, as Rock recognizes, even if there are some similarities that get to him. And this is because, as he admits later, 
He was trying to pass on his revolution to the next generation, as a leader would. I even tried unsuccessfully to pass what I couldn't accomplish on to the next generation. And Rock would be the perfect one to pass it on to, one of the few people who could understand his perspective as someone from Japan. As someone else who tried and failed constantly to make a change until he was forced to live a life of crime. It's a unique opportunity Takinaka pounced on because it keeps his very specific revolution alive even if he dies or gives it up. It's the same thing with not wanting his soldiers under his command to charge to their deaths. He needs someone to keep fighting if he can't, or else his life has just become one big lie. And really, doesn't that meek idea of continuation fit him very well? He's simply an enemy of the state, one whose loose ideals allowed him to attack any enemy and justify anything quickly. So why would his own life be any different? He doesn't need proof that he had some meaning to his life, he just needs the idea of proof. He just needs one detail to lock onto and justify everything around. That, I think, is the common point of his character, and what pulls it all together into one nice succinct package that explored a couple ideas well over a couple episodes. It also fits very well with our last video on the cost of power shown through Black Lagoon. Takanaka gained power, but his life is reduced to simply maintaining it for everything we discussed here. In that global way, all the characters that fit into the Black Lagoon puzzle is what makes it such an amazing series, especially with the skillfully incorporated history we've now so often discussed. As mentioned, links for additional reading will be in the pinned comment. But this has been a long video already, so I'll leave you with the usual. Thanks for watching, and I do hope that I'll see you again soon.